Hello and welcome to the Temple Mount Podcast. I'm Shogun. This is another session in our ongoing World of Darkness campaign. We have Shad Viano Feroth of Host Tremere, Nash Westergaard of Host Gangrel, Lucy Fairbrook of Host Tremere, and Kevin A. Filrar of the Uktena Werewolf Tribe. So, um, let's see here. Three of us were together. I don't think Nash was here last time, so he doesn't have an update. Dacian, why don't you just take us through what you remember of your first session real quick? Or as long as you want. First session, I was put on a mission to go check out what was going on in Arcadia City. I show up in Arcadia City, and I do an investigation to the known locations that things were happening, arsons, fires, and even uh, an incident at the um, library at the... um, academy and i ended up meeting peter walker and took down his information and he was also informing me about his investigation on the incidences and then i left a uh, card for shad to receive when he was available and then i went back to camp thank you uh, so how about, um, Cal- Callan? You want to give us your rendition of the last session? Yeah, from Callan's perspective, uh, Nash, uh, left his apartment, or, or, you know, um, domain, rather, and, um, he followed in suit to go to the Pyramid Nightclub, where they met up with, uh, Lucy Fairbrook. Um, while they were there, uh, Lucy let Callan know that um, there was a man, seemingly an investigator, um, from a group that uh, Callan did identify, but I don't have my notes up right now. Um, I think it was like basically a special response unit uh, from like a vague federal agency whose website was um, not very revealing and kind of seemed skeletoned. Um, But this guy was asking questions and showing pictures um, about the things that had happened in the north part of the city. Uh, Had a couple pictures of Lucy on her motorcycle, one with Sid on, uh, the back, and I think one with me. Uh, seemingly, um, when asked about all these things, Lucy denied every single thing that he brought up. Uh, I think even claimed at some point that that she did not remember riding with me at all, nor herself being out that night. Um, but she divulged all this stuff to me at the club. Um, while she was doing so, we caught the eye, or she caught the eye of someone who was staring at us. Um, it looked like... Um, she recognized this person, Callan did not. Uh, and Callan, once realizing uh, late, this person seemed to be staring at us and our group. Uh, he attempted to go uh, make some sort of a contact with that person, see if he could either get him to stop staring or to directly come out and say what he was uh, desiring uh, with his intention of staring at us. Though Callan failed to intimidate this guy, it seemed like this guy had been in plenty of rough situations before and wasn't threatened and uh, said the pyramid nightclub was neutral ground and nothing was going to happen essentially um, and while this was going on it was also apparent that the investigator must have followed uh, Lucy to the club as well uh, from my perspective I think that's just about where, where Callan ended thank you uh, so that will bring us to Lucy Yep, um, Kaylin kind of covered a lot of it, but from Lucy's perspective, um, she started at her shop last session, um, and she wanted to do a little bit more, uh, research on the dreams that she had been having, though she already had some books in her store, she wanted to get a bit of a deeper dive into it, so she headed to um, the college campus's library, and while she was there, it was pretty late at night, of course, because she's a vampire, can't be out in the sun, you know? So, she was doing some research, she found a book, um, thick leather one, Dreams and Their Interpretations. There was, um, one that was pretty on point with a dream that she had, um, about Jacob's Ladder, and, um, got more insight on her apocalyptic dreams um more of the like mundane aspects of having apocalyptic dreams which is like self-transformation but 
she knew it was probably a little bit more deeper than that um but i uh reach out to sid and ask him about like his dreams he texts me back a little bit of information and then i get a sense that i'm being watched in the library essentially um peter walker is hunting me and filming me um in the library so i just kind of try to act as normal as possible but end up sitting down and talking to him and he shows me some photos of me with sid on a bike and me with callan on a bike and i don't deny a lot i essentially um say that callan probably date raped me <laughs> um because i didn't remember that night but um i digress i um reach out to sid to give this information to shad because um shad is the one mostly at fault for these deaths that he's looking into um but then nash calls me and wants to meet sarah so we all uh um me at the pyramid nightclub and i catch callan up on it um while nash is talking to sarah and then we notice that peter walker is also there at the pyramid nightclub as well as um the ravenous bounty hunter that i've been warned about he's in the crowd and callan decides to uh, approach him and um try to intimidate him anyways we end up with that's kind of where we left off um where callan kind of steps away from me in a friendly gesture kind of like oh nice to see you and then breaks off and then um yeah that's where we left off thank you so finally shad if you would be so kind Shad is laying low in a hotel where he's cast magical darkness to help him continue his studies. He uh, received a visitor that was Sid Rogers to tell him that there is somebody from the government here that uh, doesn't have Shad's best interest in mind. Which didn't bother Shad that much as uh, he wasn't convinced that this is anything particularly um bothersome definitely in relation to free time with um being able to study the the books the books take precedent uh, precedence over whatever whatever agent is poking around and on that note sid helped shad um translate and record some of the books um Shad has been carrying around, which included a full description of the Black Mast and the um, demon summoning of uh, Paimon that was uh, performed at the basement of the Anglican Church where Sid's blood was spilled and Callan drank thereof, um, as well as the Book of Father's Vengeance, which is a compilation of Tremere knowledge related to the Book of Nod and the Magical Path. Um, which a very low level at a very low level Shad is just beginning to attain when he learnt the first spell on that path he was able to see a psychic imprint of Callan and Ashura um I think that's it Okay, thank you. Also, we forgot our Bible verse. Uh, can someone give us our Bible verse? Sure. For wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It kindles the thickets of the forest, and they roll upward in a column of smoke. Through the wrath of Yahweh Sabaoth, the land is scorched, and the people are like fuel for the fire. No one spares another. They slice meat on the right, but are still hungry. They devour on the left, but are not satisfied. Each devours the flesh of his own arm. Thank you. So we're going to start with the majority of the players who are currently in the Pyramid Nightclub. Uh, it is uh, about, say, 1 a.m., uh, if that makes sense. 
And uh, you guys are in the active, packed, uh, social, musical environment of the Pyramid Nightclub. And, um, yeah, I can't remember what you guys, I think you had all declared an action at the beginning of the last session, or the end of the last session, and then we said hold on to it, so was anyone planning to, to do something that they remember? I think I just texted Shad when I found out that one, the um, the uh, investigator who um, seemed like heavily questioned Lucy was present as if he followed her to the nightclub, um, as well as knowing that the whip is out and active and the pressures are rising and we got people staring us down in the club. I think I sent Shad a text saying that like, kitchen's getting a little bit hot, maybe a good time to start heading toward Arcadia. Okay. Uh, so you guys are still in the club. Uh, you've noticed the individuals that you've noticed, like Peter Walker sitting at the bar having a drink, kind of pretending to not be paying attention to you, but knowing that you know that he is, <clears throat> as well as the uh, vampire that uh, was sitting over in one of the VIP lounges that Nash, or rather Callan, had approached. So do you guys want to take any further actions here or go somewhere else? I know Lucy had gone to the crowd and was dancing to kind of soften the sort of eyes that were on her. So it's possible that um, she could break away from that and head to meet up with other people. Yeah, Cal Callan will walk outside and uh, stand outside on his own having a cigarette as if uh, taking a break from the activities inside. Okay. Uh, go ahead and roll perception or alertness or something like that. Perception. Okay. Serve it. Perception. <laughs> Difficulty? I'll call it seven. Uh, one success. A nine. <clears throat> okay, so out front there's the usual line of people waiting to get in, as well as people outside having cigarettes and talking, uh, taking a break from the atmosphere indoors. There's various kinds of vehicles parked in the parking lot. But you do notice one uh, that kind of stands out to you. It's like a very sort of shiny black... Uh, sedan type vehicle and you it's all all the windows are tinted including the front window which strikes you as unusual and illegal usually mm -hmm. is the vehicle you running get, no but you get a strange strange sensation of being watched okay um uh, i guess i'll uh finish up the cigarette check my messages to see if Shad's either received or responded to my messages at this point in time. What did you send me? I just sent a message saying that essentially like, you know, kitchen's getting hot, maybe a good time to go to Arcadia City. I'm going to respond with a one word. No, period. No. Okay. Okay. So, knowing that I got a response at least, um, and seeing that it's a no, I think I'm going to get my driver to uh, take me by the library to see if Shad's there. Maybe we can talk about his objection in person. So you arrived with your personal driver, and you want to leave with your personal driver as well? Yep. At this point? Okay. And I'll, so you uh, I'll, keep, I'll keep my eyes out for the peculiar vehicle that I didn't recognize and that I'm, you know, aware of anyway, just to see if they follow us or if they just stay there or whatever since the vehicle is Is Lucy off. with you? Uh, I think Lucy said she was going to meet up with some other people. I don't know. What... Well, no, she was in the club with you and she was if talking she... about meeting up with if, you and Nash. If she, uh, if she came out while I was smoking a cigarette, she's more than welcome to come. It's up to her. Mm. I, won't, I won't mention the vehicle to her, though. <clears> hmm. <throat> I'll head out after he. I saw him head out, but disc discreetly, as discreetly as possible. 
Oh. Okay. And I'll join him. And uh, is Nash also there? Yeah, he was. He's he's welcome to come to you, I suppose. I don't know. Nash no, is no, actually no, gonna... knowing, knowing that. Nash... No, go ahead. Go ahead. Just really quick. Nash actually uh, left the Pyramid Nightclub looking for a, you know a more hip party because this one was getting too hot. And um, yeah, if the night ends, I'm just gonna take a dirt nap somewhere, and you know I'll catch up with people later. Okay, so Nash Westergaard leaves on his motorcycle to do his own thing. And Lucy follows uh, Callan out of the nightclub and into the Cascadia night. And uh, Callan, knowing that the investigator was there and um, how he was keenly, you know, paying attention to Lucy, um, I'm going to be looking out to see if he's watching or observing as Lucy gets into the vehicle before I do. Yeah. Uh, can you maybe give us a description of your driver since he's someone that you, you know, potentially are going to interact with in an ongoing basis? Like, who um, is he? What kind of person is he? Or whatever. What does he look like? Or what's his name? I mean... Um, sure. Um, you can name him if you want to, but he's just going to okay. be a, uh, a fairly older gentleman, um, probably in his mid-60s. Um, got a golfer's hat on, a white guy, a bit of a belly. Um, used to be in law enforcement, but is retired. And uh, I guess he's just driving for me um, as a means to uh, cover his insurance and things like that in retirement. So, But he's aware of your, for example, like body disposal, right? Yep. Didn't he help you with that? So he, uh-huh. knows that he knows about the nature of some of your affairs. Yep. Okay, so we'll call him Mr. Thomas, your driver. So you gesture to Mr. Thomas, who is waiting and watching, and he pulls up in front of the club uh, and open, you know, the, to allow you to enter the vehicle. And uh, you do so. Are you going to get in the front seat or the back seat? Uh, I'll get in the front. Okay, okay. Yeah, and stream he gets in the back, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. <clears throat> so as you pull away, you do uh, look back to see if there's any sign of the agent uh, in the gray suit, the tall, thin man with gray hair and gray eyes. And indeed, uh, as you are leaving, you do see him stepping out of the front door of the nightclub and looking around and then looking in your direction uh, as you're leaving. But he's just standing in front of the nightclub as you begin to drive away. I guess we'll have uh, we'll have Lucy roll her like perception check gotcha <clears throat> what's the the six uh we'll call it seven okay Am I doing that with my aspects on top of it too? Perception and aspects? That's sort of my understanding of it, how it works, yeah. Cool. Oh, I failed. <laughs> no successes? <laughs> no. All right. Okay. Yikes. Well, you, regardless, you pull out into the night and you begin driving in the direction of which destination did you say? The library? Yeah, we'll go to the library, see if we can find Chad, maybe at his office or somewhere over there. Okay, so you're talking about the library on Cascadia campus? That's right. All right, so your driver begins taking you there, and as is usually his custom, he takes kind of back lanes and back routes to be uh, inconspicuous. Unfortunately, you suddenly find one of those routes blocked uh, by a black vehicle with tinted windows uh, that is parked directly in front of you, like uh, the street that you're trying to go down in this back lane, and... Then you notice that there's a second vehicle pulling up behind you, effectively sandwiching you or or boxing you in, preventing you from driving forward or backwards. Yep. Well, um, nowhere to get out, I guess. So, well, you're... I'll I'll step out of the vehicle and uh, uh, with one foot in and one foot out, I'll kind of look at the vehicle that's in front of me and kind of raise my arms up like like you know kind of what's the big deal like what's going on here so as you get out of your vehicle simultaneously people exit the two black vehicles the one in the vehicle behind you who exits is the very same uh, agent or government agent 
who you had seen in the Pyramid Nightclub. And he's got sunglasses on. He's got kind of like short spiked gray hair, maybe late 30s, early 40s. And he is holding in his hand a very like uh, fancy, like six shot revolver with like a silver, like filigreed, like, um, you know, barrel and like an ivory stock handle that he's got trained on you. And at the same time, a man gets out of the other vehicle, big, powerfully built man wearing a gray trench coat who has spiky blonde hair and circular uh, rimmed glasses on. And uh, he comes out with a a crossbow in his hand, um, which he is also pointing in your direction. And Peter Walker, the government agent, says, Mr. Clark, good evening. Do me a favor and put your hands on the back of your head just for a moment. And please don't make any sudden moves. This is just... uh, uh, I have some questions to ask you. Uh, questions to ask me under gunpoint and with uh, a vehicle blocking me both fore and aft. Uh, I can't imagine that I understand this kind of questioning. He says, uh, and he also, with his left hand, keeping his his pistol trained on you with his right, he pulls out some kind of federal badge, you know, and holds it open. Um you can't see the details of what it says or whatever, but it has some kind of emblem on it that you don't recognize. Mm -hmm. And he says, uh, you know, that he's under the authority of the federal government and the jurisdiction of the crisis response team of Cascadia. And as he says this, the man uh, behind with the trench coat kind of smiles in like a very like predatory way. And he's keeping like the crossbow trained on you as well. I'll say, uh, well, you're an investigator. Well, I'm also an investigator. Um, not associated with the government, obviously, but private says, investigator. He says, hands on the back of your head, please, sir, where I can see them. Yeah, I'll put my, I'll put my hands there. Okay. So as you do that, he begins approaching you and taking out, like, a pair of handcuffs from his, like, belt. Um, okay, as he gets, as he gets, how, is he getting, like, am I facing him still? Yeah. Well, it's up to you which way you're facing, but presumably you're watching him because he's walking towards you with handcuffs and a pistol. All right. um, I guess I want to make a dominate roll. uh, Okay. For a command. Uh, Let's see here. Let me verify this again. The system is player player rolls manipulation plus intimidation. Difficulty equals the target's current willpower points. Uh, Let me see. Manipulation and intimidation. Difficulty equals the current player's willpower points? Yeah, the person, the target's willpower points. And what is the maximum? 10, right? Yeah, I'd imagine so, yep. Okay, well, it's going to be a difficulty of 9. Okay. So I do manipulation plus intimidation, 9 rolls. Uh, difficulty 9. Yeah. And I got to pull 9. Uh, let's see here. Two successes. Uh, one's a ten, and one's a nine. Uh, one's a ten, and one's a nine. Okay, now yep. the it, the word I'm the gonna, word I was going to say is just I was just going to say don't. As far as like the cuffs go. Okay. Don't. Sure. Um, now I'm going to roll that he can roll willpower. It says willpower. Uh, difficulty. Do you know what the difficulty would be to uh, resist your dominate? Um, all this how says is like it just says uh, the more successes force the subject to act with greater vigor or for a longer duration. Um, continue running for a number of turns. Go off on a laughing. Ga- okay, blah blah blah. That's worthless. Uh, remember okay. too that being commanded to against one nature confound the user. Uh, of this power, being told to sleep in a dangerous situation or attack in police custody may not have a desired effect. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about contesting roles, but um, okay, it just well, says, I'm it just says I think it's string. I think his I'm willpower gonna... is the contest for me to be able to succeed or not. Okay, well I'm going to rule that this individual, for whatever reason, has exceptionally strong willpower. I'm okay. going to let him roll one dice to try and... He's going to spend a point of willpower, and he's going to roll one dice, and we'll say it's a difficulty of nine for him to resist your dominating effect. Sure. So he makes no success. So when you say don't, he seems to interpret the command as stop, and he temporarily, like, falters in his step forward and, like, kind of freezes. 
and then like a look of irritation kind of like goes across his face. But as okay. he does so, the man with the crossbow behind you runs like closer and gets like a drag beat on you and he goes, enough of your mind tricks. I'm still in the car. Yeah. Um, I'm watching this happen from the back seat. I want to read their minds. Okay. Um, um, just so, just for the sake of the, yeah. just the continuity of what happened, um, the way the way dominate and command works specifically is like it's kind of blended into a conversation. So the word "don't" is going to be blended into the, into the sentence. Uh, don't think that uh, the handcuffs are necessary. I'm more than willing to have a conversation if that's what you're requiring of me. All right. So that being the case, I'll retcon his response to um, reflexively putting the handcuffs back on his belt, but he still keeps his pistol trained on you, and he also stops his forward advance and like a look of kind of mild perplexity crosses his face. But at the same time, it appears that the man with the crossbow somehow has recognized that you've done something here, and so he runs up closer to you, points the the crossbow at you, and says, "No more mind tricks, freak." So now I'll, it's I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll keep my hands there and I'll just say uh, what exactly did you say your government's agency was again? So we'll jump to Lucy so that she can do her what she wants mm-hmm. to do. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I want to jump into um, what's his face, the main guy uh, Peter's mind. Um, so I have to roll intelligence plus sub Substerfuge. Um. Perfect. Target's mind requires projecting thoughts into target's mind. Okay. Um. One success must be rolled for each item of information to be plucked. Okay, so depending on how many successes I get is the amount of information I get from his mind. So. Cool. What do you want the difficulty to be? Um, we're going to say it's eight. Okay. You got... sense that this person has an unusually strong mind, which is somewhat shielded somehow against your intrusion. Yeah, so I had one failure, so that canceled out one, so I have one success. Okay. Uh, well, you get kind of like a flashback like a a memory like when you're looking into his mind you can see a memory and basically you see him standing beside other individuals uh dressed in similar like government attire with like a whole bunch of computers around them and people sitting at those computers and then there's a huge screen like a projector as well as like dozens of smaller screens everywhere and they're watching various scenes using like thermal imaging cameras basically the, there's like a scientist there wearing like a lab coat who's like pointing at like certain certain people on these cameras and pointing out that they are quote unquote cold bodies who don't resonate like um, biological heat and this is like a memory that he has and then that's all you're able to extract out of his mind dope so did you say something Colin that you were going to do or say Nope, I was just, um, you know, like, tongue-in-cheek, um, you know, when he points out to stop the mind tricks, I'm saying, exactly what government agency are you with again? So, Peter Walker says, uh, Crisis Response Team, Cascadia uh, Intelligence and Counterintelligence Division, under authority of the Department of National Defense. And I'll say, uh, exactly what mind tricks do you think you're referencing? I'm the not man that, with the crossbow. That charismatic. Yeah. <clears throat> the man with the crossbow quotes scripture, uh, and uh, it's something along the lines of, "But do not think that we are ignorant of the devil or his schemes, for we are we are well aware of his his ploys and his deceptions." And he was, like, seems to be quoting scripture. I'll just say, trust me, friend. I'm no I'm no ally of the devil. <clears throat> the man with the crossbow laughs and says, "Oh, we'll see about that." Now, Very well. <clears throat> the man uh, with the pistol, Peter Walker, says, "Are you willing to come quietly and answer some questions, or are we going to have to do this the hard way?" I'll just say, uh, "Sure, I'll come with you." Uh, but like I said, I don't think the handcuffs will be necessary. I'm, I'm more than willing to entertain uh, our government agents. 
I stare into a perfect He's, boy. So, I, I don't know, if Bongo's doing was like talking. Yeah, can someone put like music back on Bongo? It is a void of finite resources that can be <clears throat> so. Anyways, uh, as you say that, um, the man with the trench coat comes up behind you and kind of grabs you by the back of your own trench coat with his left hand while keeping his crossbow trained on you with his right hand. And he kind of like grabs you by the back of your neck, like by the back of your trench coat and like roughly like kind of yanks you down towards like the hood of the vehicle that you just got out of. Um, I'm not going to resist at this point. I'm just going to let him think that he's big and bad and strong, and we'll just see what happens. Um, okay. In any case, uh, he, Peter Walker, as this is happening, approaches the vehicle and says, Everybody step out of the car with your hands where I can see them. It's like pointing his pistol at the, at the vehicle. Um, I'm going to get out with my, my hands up. Okay. Um, I'll just nod at Tom, Mr. Thomas. So, uh, the man with the trench coat and the crossbow who is trying to sort of manhandle Kalen into the back of his car says, you may have uh, worked your devil magic on on, uh, on Peter Walker, but uh, it has, you didn't mesmerize me or whatever. And he takes out like a pair of like hand ties, like cable ties and starts preparing to like bind your hands behind your back. That's I'll, uh, uh, let's, yeah, I'll just let him do that for now. That's fine. Okay, he ties to, uh, your hands with like strong, like uh, cable, like cords meant for this purpose. And Peter Walker uh, approaches Lucy with the handcuffs. Um, and what rights do you have for arresting me? Yeah. He says. He says we're investigating multiple homicides. To be honest, that's only the tip of the iceberg. He says, you're in the company of the prime suspects in multiple murders and arsons in the city. And uh, as he's saying that, um, the guy with the blonde hair and the glasses is like patting you down, Kalen, and he feels your sword underneath your jacket, uh, your trench coat. And he says, and then he says, I, murders committed with a sword, one just like this. Isn't that a coincidence? And he goes to start taking your sword off your hip. It's fine. I'll just let him take it for now. Okay. So he slides your sword out of his sheath. Uh, can you describe the sword again? Yeah, it's um, it's like a medium length sword, not quite like long sword, cleaver length, a little shorter than that. One that can be concealed underneath the trench coat, um, not fastened at his waist, but fastened to his back. So about the length of his spine, like from the base of his neck on his spine to his tailbone. And it's double, double-edged, so it's got a blade on either side and just pointed at the top where the two end, uh, edges meet in the center. Enough room for so, both enough room for both hands on the grip, but can be wielded one-handed as well. So as he takes the sword out of your hand, he like flips it around like a, in like a intricate like gesture, like an intricate like fencing maneuver, as though he's like extremely familiar with like bladed weapons and he's like spinning it around in his hand and he's like, ah, this is a fine blade, perfectly balanced. I think I'll keep it for myself. So, ah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see about that. Let's just go ahead and uh, see whatever questions you think that you need to ask me and we'll go from there. Okay. So Peter is in going to put handcuffs on uh, Lucy unless she resists. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I gotta step away for a second. In, um, her hands are still up, and she just is looking at him. Um, I am just wondering why I'm being arrested because this this doesn't seem to be um, an appropriate way that you guys are doing this. Normally, there's a different fashion. Um, if you are interviewing a suspect, they come on their own free will. Um, am I 
being detained? He says, you're being detained for questioning under a spe special confidential executive authority. Um, I'm afraid I don't have time to explain further, but if you're not guilty of anything, you have nothing to worry about. I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist for the time being. And she nods her head and um, looks at him. I'm not going to resist. You don't need to put handcuffs on me. Okay, why don't you roll like charisma or manipulation or something like that? Hey, I'm so charismatic. <laughs> She's actually not, that's why it's funny. Um, the difficulty is going to be like nine because this is like a government <laughs> agent, dude. It's not yeah, I'm not going to. Oh, are you kidding me? I had one in charisma and I got a 10. That's okay, cool. so you are so, you know, innocuous and harmless and innocent seeming in your demeanor and so charismatic or whatever that, you know, against his better judgment, he nods and puts the handcuffs back on his belt, but ushers you to sit down beside uh, Callan Clark in the back seat of the vehicle um, from which the men exited. And she does. Um take a seat back there and since they didn't take some of her devices um she sends a quick text to elizabeth fairbrook with um her lo like last known location um and shares her location with elizabeth but also texts her about being taken with the crt you're you're sending text messages Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you take out your phone uh, and begin making text messages, but the man with the crossbow and the blonde hair gets uh, into the passenger seat of the vehicle, and he turns around and sees what you're doing and grabs the cell phone out of your hands or tries to. And he says, you won't be needing that. Kind of pulls her hand back. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm letting my mom know that I'm okay and that I'll be home late. Yeah, he insists, and he's like, "Give it up! Don't, don't make it! Don't make this more difficult than it has to be." She, um, this is a federal investigation, and uh, that that phone is being requisitioned as evidence for the time being. Uh, she turns it off and hands it to him. He takes it and slides it into a pocket of his trench coat, and uh, so at this point, um, both of you guys are in the back seat of the car. And he, you notice there's no like handles on the inside of the car at all. Like there's no like door handles or anything like that. And there's a plate of glass between uh, the front and back seat um, so that they can see you and you can see them, but you can't like reach them around the seat as it is. In any case, uh, now that you're both in the back of the car and apparently compliant, uh, Peter Walker begins reversing the car uh, around a corner and driving off. Uh, away from where he picked you up into Cascadia City. Are you still awake, Kalen? Kalen? He, yeah, I think he is. Yeah. Yeah, step away. Okay. Well, in that case, I guess what we should do is pause here and jump to maybe Shad or Dacian um, for a little while. Uh, are you there, Shad? Yeah. All right, so why don't we go to your scene? Okay. So you have spent the night uh, working under a cloak of occult darkness on the study of your three occult tomes with the transcription help of Sid Rogers. Uh, but after you finished that, Sid went to sleep, um, presumably on like a couch or something in the hotel room you were staying at. And uh, you also had to rest at some point, right? The same so, night they started at the club. Right. So after you finish your work, you go into a state of, of rest, right? And uh, anyways, you have a dream. And in your dream, you basically see the ocean. But the ocean is completely covered in some kind of black, oily liquid. And it's on fire. And the ocean is like burning. There's like choking black smoke rising off the ocean. And the whole ocean, as far as you can see, is like on fire. And uh, you watch this in like a weird fascination for a period of time before waking up back into your hotel room. And the first thing you notice is that 
Mr. Rogers is missing. He's not where he was sleeping when you went to, into your own state of rest. So I rise and look at my notes and my staff and get to work on the staff. You notice something unusual. Uh, when you went to bed, you had put all your books away, but one of the books is sitting on your desk or the desk in the hotel room uh, in the middle of the table uh, open, and uh, you're, you're sure you didn't leave it that way. I look around the room for signs of the magical darkness having been breached or other entry into the room. Everything seems to be exactly as it was. The door is locked from the inside. There's no broken glass. You don't see any signs of entry. I stop my movement towards the uncarved staff and slowly approach the book on the desk. With as you do so, you notice that it is the strangest uh, and most enigmatic of the books which you took from the library uh, because the language in it had no... Uh, similarity to any language living or dead with which you're familiar but instead has these sort of uncanny, asymmetrical, uh, otherworldly looking glyphs and uh, as you approach the book it seems to radiate almost like a palpable aura of just uncanniness or menace like a, a malevolent energy which seems to get stronger with each step you take towards the book and uh, when you look at the book, it's open to like a page that's a full circle uh, glyph of some kind. And it's like really intricate, but it just looks fundamentally wrong. Like just the physics of it, not the physics, but the geometry of it is just like weird and unsettling. And I'm gonna have you roll like a willpower check. Okay, DC. Which call it six. One, oh, uh, two successes. A great success, two successes, and one, one. Okay, so as you approach the book, you feel almost like it's trying to, like, invade your mind somehow, but you are able to mentally uh, force back whatever the strange, like, occult intrusion is into your consciousness and approach the book, and the kind of uh, hazy, moving image on the page, like, kind of coalesces, and you can see it clearly, and it's not like... Um, like kind of moving around in the same way anymore but you start hearing like whispers in your ears uh sinister sounding whispers in a language that you don't understand i strain my mind and try to hear more clearly what they are saying if it's um the tones that they're speaking in if they're commands if they're instructions if they're insults so one thing you can kind of tell as you're quite an old vampire is that although you can't recognize the language or languages that are whispering in your ears they do bear some phonetic resemblance to some ancient languages uh, much more than modern languages you can't necessarily tell what they're saying, but you get the sense that some of them are whispering like seductive promises and other ones are like whispering like uh, dark thoughts and suggestions and other ones are whispering like malicious curses and other ones are like making promises. It, it all kind of comes through as like a, a cloud in your mind of multiple different little voices all whispering at the same time saying different things. I they speak don't, out in it, the dark room and say... Who are you? What are you? There's no audible answer, but there's a wind, like a cold wind that blows through the hotel room, even though all the windows and doors are shut. And it like makes like three pages or four pages like like flutter past on the, the book. And then it shows like these like really unnerving, like uh, dark, like scary, unholy looking creatures with a lot of like eyes and tentacles and like you know, mouths on various parts of these like amorphous bodies and stuff like that. And again, they kind of look almost like they're moving at the edges of the pages, but like, it's like a bunch of strange, like demonic looking stuff, but not so much demonic as like Eldritch.
I sit in fascination and wonder as I see this strange magical tome moving and record in my mind the dark lift and creatures that I'm seeing. I flip through the book, marking with one finger the page that it was open to, just to see if I can find any language in the book that I can't understand. Uh, I'm sorry, did you turn the pages back to the first uh, image that it opened to? Yeah, the one Yeah, the one that it opens to that I was just looking at, I'm just going to like flip, I'm just going to thumb through the rest of the pages to look for a language if, that I can recognize and then reopen it to that same page. So as you're thumbing through uh, the book, something happens to you that you can't even remember the last time it happened, but you get a paper cut on your thumb uh, and it's quite a big one and like quite a bit of blood comes out from the paper cut and marks one of the pages uh, like as you're flipping through it with your blood and like a like wisp of what looks like smoke or vapor kind of like rises off your blood and then the red blood starts like bubbling on the page and turns black. Oh, strange, I say out loud. I, it sounds like the whispers in your voice get louder and more insistent and more malevolent sounding. I squeeze my finger to drop another um, drop of blood onto the page. Uh, as you do so, the same phenomenon repeats. It's like your blood hits the page red and begins smoking and then starts like bubbling and turning black. And again, the like voices in your mind start getting louder and it sounds like they're getting like happy sort of, like they're cheering you on, like making like this like, but in like a almost mocking way. And uh, anyways, the page will roll like a cult plus like investigation or a cult plus intelligence or something. If you want to study the tome further. D. Pardon? A DC. Uh, we'll call this one an, an eight. Zero successes, 10 and eight and two ones. All right. So as you are studying the book, you feel like you're starting to make progress and identifying certain patterns and syntax and structure of the words on the page. But at the same time, the whispering in your ears is distracting you and a strange kind of like uncanny uh, sort of daze comes over you because the words seem to have some kind of like hypnotic or mesmerizing quality. So you're unable to, to discern anything else at this point from the, the strange occult tone. As the voices begin to recede, I close the book and kind of run my hand over the cover. I can't wait to unlock your secrets, I say, as I turn back towards the staff and begin to carve. Okay, go ahead and roll your talisman creation check, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh... I'm going to spend some blood points here to, um, I'm going to spend some, uh, I'm either going to spend some blood points or some willpower points to get extra successes here. Cause the math doesn't work out unless we have the mechanic that you can spend willpower. Like the math is impossibly sure. high unless we have that mechanic in the game. Yeah. Even. Okay. So, um, I'm going to spend two points of willpower to get two automatic successes and then three points of blood to raise my intelligence to its generational maximum. And that gives me a dice pool of 11 plus two successes and the difficulty is six. I got six plus two and a great success. Can I count that 10 as an extra one? Yes. Six, seven, eight, nine. And I need a total of 20 over a one a week roll. Or I have to start over. Okay, so, so you, nine. 
you put the staff on the desk and focus all your attention on the complicated occult ritual that must be weaved in order to imbue it with magical properties and you find that you are able to focus extremely well and make rapid success in this. I'm subsumed mentally in the carving of the talisman in including on it runes and symbols that are shorthand for my vast knowledge of magical skills and occult mysticism, leaving room on it for what I may yet unlock from the other books. This work takes me further into the night as I continue to focus on the creation of the talisman. Very well. Uh, are you back, Callan, just out of curiosity? He's going to be AFK for a bit. He might not be okay. able to come back, so we could do the yeah, interview yeah. separately, or we can jump to Dayson. Yeah. Uh, Ke uh, Kevin, are you there? I'm there. All right. So you had gone to sleep um, at the house of... Oh, jeez. Uh, Nola's going to get mad at me. I think it was John and uh, Sarah were the two... Uh, children of Garu, um, or children, children of Gaia, uh, Garu, or werewolves, who are your kith. They are your friends, and your tribe has tribal bonds with them uh, in a mutual alliance of multiple tribes, um, but they're not your actual blood kin. Nevertheless, they have a nice uh, little house in Wildwood Park that's uh, kind of quaintly decorated with a lot of hippie type stuff, like didgeridoos and. Uh, some crystals and stones and like incense and uh, you know hash pipes and all that kind of stuff lying around and uh, they're both sleeping and you're also sleeping uh, and as you sleep you're dreaming and what you're dreaming about is the forests that you recognize from your childhood in Canada that where you grew up and where you you know learned about your tribe and your family and your your bloodline uh, and you see all those trees being cut down like really, really fast. Like they're just falling like cards and there's humans just like bulldozing the forest, sawing down the trees and then like digging up the ground and then like pumping toxic waste into like this big open pit. And it's all like playing out and like fast forward. Or you're just watching like the forest be destroyed by this like human industrial activity, leaving behind only this like yellow, like glowing toxic waste. And then you wake up with like sweat on your body and like a sense of like fear and dread from the dream. And you wake up into the house. Ah, disgusting. I get up and cook myself some beef. All right, so you go to the freezer and pull out a big chunk of beef. Uh, the whole freezer is full of meats, and you throw it on a pan and start frying it up and cooking it. And um, just one question, if Estremi is there, if anyone knows. Do you know what the like, moon, moon phase is right now? It's about to be a new moon tomorrow, so it's in the dark phase right now and the sign of cancer. Thanks. Uh, so anyways, uh, the meat smells delicious, you're quite hungry, your stomach is growling, and before long you've cooked it, unless you were planning to eat it raw. But, um, yeah. So you sit down and enjoy a meal. Um, you feel a calling, uh, just sort of like a primal calling to, you know, go outside because you're, you know, you've grown up outside of the city in the wilderness and uh, you're not really comfortable being inside of like a confined space so you feel some some kind of you know impulse or urge to to go out into the night i do so all right so as you walk out into the night the like fresh smell of the night air and the trees and everything all around you makes you feel more comfortable and more at home uh, and you realize this is actually like a you know urban forest so uh, you know, the, it's quite dark, so you can see the stars in the sky and, uh, you know, hear the wind blowing through the trees and, uh, you know, you have a, a desire to explore or to uh, stretch your legs. It's actually quite a strong feeling uh, and you start to realize like it's almost like something is calling you into the darkness. I go towards the calling. 
you follow your instinctual sense uh, into the darkness, away from the houses and deeper into the woods of Wildwood Park. And uh, I'm going to have you go ahead and roll like a perception check of your own. So that can be like awareness or perception. Difficulty. Seven. Eight, eight, six. Two successes. Okay. So as you uh, lope off into the night and deeper into the trees of this like urban forest, you notice something kind of strange. Uh, and you turn around and notice that there's three crows that are following you. They're not cawing or making any noise. And they're staying at a respectful distance, but every time you move forward, they fly to another tree nearby, uh, and they seem to be following you as you are moving into the woods. Interesting. You continue walking into the woods, and uh, even here in the forest, uh, there's occasional... Um, patches of, of open sky letting in what little moonlight there is but you know you grew up in the wilderness so you can see well in the dark and uh, you notice two very beautiful dogs uh, they look like dogs but sort of also like they might have some wolf blood in them they're both like perfectly white and have like blue icy blue eyes and they're standing and like looking at you um, about you know 20 feet away Okay. As as I look at me, I I morph into lupus form. Okay. Do you know the mechanics behind that by any chance? Like, do you have to roll something or spend a point or something? I don't believe I have to because I have the metamorph ability, but I can look real quick what that says. Let's see here. I'm having a hard time finding it. <clears throat> well, that's okay. Um, you, you, we can assume that you are able to shapeshift uh, at will into your lupus form. Do you know what... Um, what that does to your stats, like each of your different uh, forms changes your stats, like gives you more strength. Or... So lupus form is one strength, two dexterity, two stamina, negative three manipulation, negative two perception dif difficulty, and uh, difficulty of six. Cool. So in any case, uh, you feel your bones morphing and elongating and shaping and fur coming out of your skin. And you go through the you know, graphic and uh, dramatic process of transforming from your hominid human form to your lupine wolf form. Uh, can you describe your lupine form? Like what color are you as a wolf and so forth? Uh, brown wolf. Brown wolf with uh, one white eye. So as you uh, go through your shift, the two wolves kind of like are alarmed and they kind of like rear up on their hack, their hackles go up and they start kind of like growling and like baring their teeth and they look kind of like frightened, but they like, they kind of lean back, but they don't like run away and they start like growling, and like putting up their like hackles. I, uh, I kind of mimic what they're doing. Um, Standing my ground. So you growl back at them. Uh, and as you do so, you see someone emerge from the woods. Uh, it's a young woman, uh, probably early 20s, attractive, uh, but looks albino, almost like alabaster white skin, pale pink eyes, pale pink hair. Um, looks like, yeah, essentially like an albino. And she's wearing like a black hoodie and like black like running pants and black running shoes. And she's smiling with like an intrigued uh, curiosity 
uh, type expression on her face as she like walks out and stands between the two wolves and she kind of puts her hands on both of their necks and they sort of relax a little bit. And she says, well, 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 isn't this interesting? And kind of stand down and approach her slowly. As you do so, she sort of squats down on all fours and in front of your eyes and to your surprise, uh, goes through a similar metamorphosis to your own. The only difference being that it seems that the darkness and the shadows sort of close around her as she goes through this transformation, somewhat obscuring it from your view. But when the process is finished, she is sitting uh, between the two wolves in a wolf form herself. But unlike them, she's not a dog or part dog. She's a full wolf like you. And uh, her fur is completely black. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, she kind of comes towards you, like sniffing as she approaches. A kind of a uh, hint to her, like, like pointing where the call that I was getting was heading, and I'm kind of telling her that I want to go that way. Well, you actually get the feeling that the call was coming from precisely here, and you feel like the call was coming from this uh, creature, whatever she is, um, and that you've been led to directly the right place. And as though to confirm that, the three crows that are following you uh, fly out and make like a triangle formation like around the scene that's unfolding, looking down as she comes closer to you. And as she does so, she kind of bares her fangs and like begins growling in like a deep, like low growl. Okay. Uh, I uh, stay alert and stand guard as she approaches me. Okay. Well, her two white companion dogs also approach following, you know, in a triangular formation behind her and also sort of bearing their fangs as they're like approaching towards you. So I'm going to have you guys roll initiative and actually initiate combat here because uh, all at once the pack, such as it is, sort of surges towards you. Uh, she comes straight at you and the two white wolves, um, or white dogs kind of try and flank you from both sides at the same time. So we're going to have you roll initiative, and then there'll be three initiative rolls for the three of them. How do I do the initiative rolls? I think you just roll 1d10. Or there's an actual you... thing, uh, slash roll, there's like an initiative one. Um... Yeah, slash dice initiative. Flash dice initiative, eh? And then it's, yeah, your dexterity plus wits. Okay, well, I'm just going to do this. So the first roll is going to be for her, and the second and third roll will be for the wolves. I'm just going to roll 3d10. So she rolled an initiative of two, and they rolled nine and ten. Now you said you had what again? It's wits plus dexterity? With plus dexterity, it's so I have three. And can you tell me one more time what the stat change is when you turned yourself into a wolf? Uh, so strength one, dexterity two, stamina two, manipulation negative three, uh, perception negative two. So dexterity plus two, you mean? Dexterity plus two, yeah. So I get five. Okay. So then I'm going to say that. Um, <laughs> Cat is going crazy. Um, yeah, dexterity plus two. Okay, so I'm going to say she has a dexterity of six and then a wits of four. So that's going to be a total of 14 for her. And I'm going to say that they both have a dexterity of four, but they don't get any addition to that, meaning that would be, and then wits of, we'll say two. So that's uh, 15. And 14, yeah. And so what was your total uh, initiative roll? Five. Five? Yeah. That can't be right, can it? No, because you roll one dice, and then you add 
your dexterity plus your wits. So you, you can't be five. Oh, so I have to roll first. You roll 1d10. Okay, hold on. Dice. Roll. One. Let's see if I can find that. Sorry, I don't, I'm trying to figure out this Discord rolling system. Yeah, that's okay. You know, slash dice. Slash dice roll. And that the pool, I just put one. Difficulty. Ten. D10. Yeah, everything's D10 in this game. You can save your, like, copy and paste the dice roll thing that makes it faster in the future. But... So I got a nine... Nine plus five, fourteen. Okay. Uh, uh. Wait one second. Shoot, I just had that. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Bite is the dexterity plus bronze. Damage. Now to go to the initiative. Oh, did you do it in WD chat? No. No, I'm in the rolls channel. Yeah. Uh, okay. So sorry, you said you got a total of fourteen. Fourteen plus one. Okay, so yeah. initiative. Um, the fastest attack comes from your right side, from the white wolf on the right side, who lunges towards your neck with its teeth, attempting to bite you and sink its teeth into your neck. So, it's going to roll. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to memorize the combat and do everything properly. Nola put the rules reference there. So again, it's dex plus brawl, accuracy plus one, strength plus one damage. Okay. So d10, count five, difficulty normal. <clears throat> one failure, two successes. So. Uh, the the white wolf manages to sink its teeth into your uh, right flank, just below your neck. And rolling for damage, then, is going to be strength plus one. So we'll play that. Four. Oops. Okay. Plus one damage. So you take three damage. Um, from the bite, which you can mark on your damage sheet, on your character sheet. But anyways, blood uh, comes out of the wound and kind of soaks into the fur on the right side of your neck, and you feel pain as the dog, you know, sinks its teeth into you. Uh, however, you can then react next as you're tied with everyone else for initiative. Um. All right, as I uh, get bit, you see my face kind of cringe, and I get a little irritated and morph into uh, my Krenos form. Okay, and again, uh, as far as you know, you don't have to like spend any points or make any rolls for that? Correct. Okay, so you uh, call upon the aspect of the warrior inside of you that you inherited through the full moon that you were born under and through your... Two werewolf parents, making you like a full-blooded werewolf, and uh, you suddenly rear up with like an audible sound of like cracking bones onto two legs, and you like stretch up visibly and increase greatly in size until you're like you know eight and a half, nine feet tall, and just like hulking werewolf form with claws and on your hands and feet, and your skull elongates into a muzzle full of teeth. As you do so. Um, you know the two the two dogs like cringe back in terror, and even uh, the approaching black wolf sort of pauses with like a uh, expression of like hesitation and stops its forward advance. I kind of laugh. Ah, fucking knew it. 
Anyways, uh, the wolves seem to recover uh, at, like, maybe you kind of sense, like, an impulse pass between the black wolf and the two white dogs, and they kind of recover from their fear and start, like, approaching you again uh, in, a, in a menacing manner. And she, likewise, like, is kind of, like, warily pacing to the side, but, like, kind of, like, still keeping her eye on you, like she's trying to find an angle in. Um, is it my time to attack or? Yeah, it's your initiative. All right, so I will approach one of the white wolves and try to go for a grapple to try to rip them in half. Okay. Um, you're going to try and like grab it and like rip it in half. Yeah. So in the rules reference. Uh, the closest thing to that would be, I guess, clinch, which is strength plus brawl. Well, I have grapple here for brawl, which is you, dexterity you also plus do hold. brawl. Difficulty is six. Okay. So you're using uh, grapple as the skill? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's under, it's under brawl, but yeah. Right. Grapple. You have a specialty in it, you mean? Uh, no, like five it's just, points. I have five points in brawl. Yeah. All right. Right. Okay. So you're going to attempt to initiate a hold or a clinch uh, or whatever using that skill. Here it says those are both strength, strength plus brawl. But you can, if you know martial arts or something, you can use grapple to grab it. I guess. But it's a wolf, so strength plus brawl. Okay. So yeah, if you're going to try and rip it in half, do strength plus brawl. And the difficulty on that is going to be like a 10 because you're ripping a wolf in half. But first you have to, to grab it. So the first, thing to, so the first thing to do will be roll dexterity plus brawl to grab it. Dexterity plus... Okay, hold on. I forgot to do that again. Sorry. So I use slash dice roll? Yep. And then pool would be ten. Yeah. Difficulty. Do I have is to gonna be the difficulty is gonna be seven to grab onto the wolf. Okay. Seven successes. Okay, so you manage to grab the wolf easily in like a bear hug type like grip, and you just like grab it into your arms easily and pick it up like it doesn't weigh anything. And then go ahead and roll strength plus brawl to do damage. Uh, difficulty? Um, well, six to do damage. Success of four. Did, what did you roll? Four, two, eight, eight, six, critical, <laughs> fail, five, seven, seven, four. So it's three successes, I think, right? Uh, it says four successes. Okay. I got eight, eight, six, seven, seven, but I got a critical fail. So okay. Two, two. All right. So in any case, um, you manage to, you kind of sink your claws in and try and like rip the wolf in half. And you don't manage to like fully rip it in half, but you like rip its like a uh, stomach and like rib cage open so that it's like, Guts come out on the ground and it like rolls over and starts like frothing and like flailing back and forth, but it's like you know dead basically. Um, so you manage to remove one of the the two dogs from the fight. However, the second one uh, responds by attacking you, uh, le trying to bite you in the back of one of your legs. Let me just see here. Yeah. So this is going to be another bite attack from the second white wolf. All right, so it manages to bite into the back of your left calf. And for damage... Strength plus one. 
You can soak the wolf. Oh yeah, you get to try and soak damage too. But we'll just we'll figure the damage first, and then so one damage. So you've now taken four damage. Now you can attempt to soak that damage so that you won't take it, and it's a difficulty of six. Oh, what do I roll with? Let's start. Um, he said with four dice. Do four dice difficulty six, yeah. Except for you, it'd probably be even more than that because your stamina is currently like boosted or whatever, right? Do you include that extra stamina from your Krynos form? My stamina is four, and then I get a plus three stamina. So roll three more. Okay, one. so you managed to soak one damage, but because you rolled two critical failures, you only soaked one damage. So the total damage you took this turn so far is three. Now, <clears throat> the black wolf approaches you and like locks eyes with you, and its eyes are like luminous, like shining, reflecting light, um, almost so they're like kind of glowing, and you feel a uh, sense of like uh, mental presence pressing upon your mind from this black wolf that was previously a girl and uh, she seems to be attempting to dominate or mesmerize you um, so the role for that I think is going to be her dominate skill and the difficulty I believe is going to be your willpower what is your willpower? My willpower is four. Four? Yeah. Okay. You can, I believe you can spend a willpower if you want to resist this. Um, yeah. So she's rolling dominate. Uh, no successes. So she seems to lock eyes with you and attempt to mentally cow you into submission uh, through some kind of psychic means, but you're able to shake it off and resist it. Um, which means the first wolf is dead, so the action passes back to you again. Alright, um... We're going to go for the other white wolf. And let's see here. So you can do attacks like bite or claw. All of the rules for attacks are in the rules reference channel. We'll do a bite. All right. So it's Dex plus brawl, difficulty of five, it looks like, with a strength plus one ag aggravative or a aggravated damage. Aggravated damage, yeah. So. Difficulty, six or five. Four successes. All right, so you snap down with your giant maw and sink your huge fangs into the uh, remaining white wolf dog. So go ahead and roll your damage, um, which is going to be whatever it says in that sheet there. Uh, doesn't say that it's oh strength plus one aggregate. Okay, so Uh, what's the difficulty? Uh, six, I believe. Sorry. Holy shit. Zero successes. Okay, are you sure that you rolled the right amount of dice? Yeah, you rolled three botches. 
critical success. So as your teeth snap shut, uh, they catch only like the fur on the back of the neck. It like manages to sort of twist out of the way so that your uh, fangs sink through fur rather than flesh. Uh, in any case, uh, the action is going to go back to the remaining white wolf. going to attack. I'm trying to do this as quick as I can. How can I tell uh, how much health I have? Uh, you have a you have a chart on your character sheet that shows levels of injury. Also, werewolves are able to heal even during fights. They can uh, heal damage. Um, what's going on here? So I had one extra bruise. Damage. Those are one each, right? Yeah, and the yeah, because I would be mauled right now if you're taking three damage. Only three damage. Oh, I'm hurt then. Hurt. You would have uh, you would have healed each turn, probably one damage. So, how many have you taken total the entire battle? Six. No, okay. no, I don't think you did take yeah, you that much. Too. You didn't take that much damage. You took four, and you soaked one. You took a total of three. Okay, then I'm hurt. But you also heal one point of damage a turn, I think Nolo is saying. Yeah, yeah, so you basically would have healed. So I think you'd be at, like, two. Judging from what you said, I'm not tight. I'll be at my computer in a bit. I'm putting my groceries. Yeah. Um, so in any case, the remaining wolf sinks its teeth into the calf of your left leg and starts, like, thrashing its mouth back and forth, trying to, you know, tear into the meat of your leg. Um, So you're going to take an additional three damage, but you can attempt to soak it on a difficulty of six with your total stamina. All right. Uh, I don't soak it. You getting some bad rolls tonight. Uh, so, okay, so add an additional three damage, so that means you've taken a total of six now. So what does that put you at? One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm at mauled. Okay, and how many more? What, is, what, what comes after that? Crippled, and then in cap, and yeah, okay. If you okay. want to point out soak rolls, he should have been rolling seven instead of four. My bad. I, for, I keep forgetting he's in Krino's form. Yeah, so roll three more soak dice. Oh, shit. Sorry. One soak. Okay, so you took two more damage. So you've taken five. Watch me die. Uh, in any case, so I think the action goes to you now. Um, no, you tried to bite the wolf. The wolf tried to bite you. It's Litu's turn again. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, she is going to, um, transform herself back into her human form. Um, and then, at the same time, or in the same turn, she's going to extend uh, her claws using uh, her discipline of uh, protein. So she trans transforms herself back into human form in front of you, and then flexes both of her hands, and like long black talons slide out. Mm. Now, I don't think I think we're saying transformation doesn't take a turn. If she has metamorphosis. Right. Well, we'll say those those two actions. She metamorphosized and she used her protein skill. Oh, okay. I see what you're saying, yeah. So we'll go back to you now. All right, I don't know. Well, she probably should have tried to bite you as a wolf, but it will. We'll go for the white dog again and go for another bite. Um, nice.
Uh, difficulty of five. Okay, so five right. successes. Now that was to hit or for damage? To hit. And then... Okay, so for damage, it's going to be strength plus one for bite. Aggravated damage. Okay. Difficulty six. All right. So, all right. So, successes. yeah. So, you close your fangs around the skull of the dog that is uh, biting your leg and crush its skull with your incredible bite force and just completely bite its head off in one bite. Leaving it dead, and uh, the the vampire, the the girl, seeing her second wolf die, looks at you and hisses in rage. And then she kind of like sizes up the scene, and you covered in blood, and her two dead dogs. And so she like just like snarls, and then turns and like runs extremely fast away from you into the woods. Uh, trying to think if I should follow her. I should run back to camp. I, did, I healed once, so Let's see him at. I'm gonna let her go. Um, I'm gonna head back to camp. Covered okay. in blood. Do you have any points in like medicine, first aid, anything like that? I have three in medicine. So if you want, you could try and uh, do some first aid on yourself. Slash dice. Also, difficulty what? So we're going to assume that you go back to your human form now to do this? Yeah. All right. So you transform back into your hominid form. What would be the difficulty? Six. Okay. Six unless otherwise specified. Okay. So three successes. So you... you um. You apply basic first aid using your knowledge of medicine, and you manage to uh, combined with your combined with your superhuman healing, uh, you heal three three damage from the first aid, and one, I guess, just from the passage of time. Okay, I'm fully healed. Okay, so your clothes are shredded uh, and bloody, um, but you are no longer injured from your encounter with the two. Dogs and the mysterious pink-haired woman. So maybe we'll pause your story here. Uh, Callan, are you back? Yep, I'm back. All right. So you guys are currently both in the back seat of what you presume is a government vehicle with a plate of glass separating you from the drivers. Kalen's hands are bound by some kind of uh, thick plastic ties. Lucy's hands are free, but her phone has been taken away. Peter Walker, the tall, thin agent in the gray suit, uh, wearing the sunglasses, and his companion in the trench coat who had the crossbow are in the front seat, driver's side and passenger side, respectively. And they're taking you through a circuitous maze of back streets uh, into an area of the city to which you are not familiar, or uh, with you, which you are not familiar. And they eventually come to a underground parkade with like a big metal uh, escalating door which automatically opens as the vehicle approaches and drives inside and the door closes behind so that your car is now uh, in an underground concrete room, which is quite spacious, but virtually empty. There's a series of lockers alongside one wall, small desk on the other wall. Most of the are, space is... Are we getting, are we getting no opportunity to interact while we're on you the drive can, or anything? You can, declare, you can declare an action at any time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, well, okay, well, while we're driving, um, be before getting there, um, I'd like to uh, try to make conversation with these guys um, prior to being pulled into some <laughs> unknown building. Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, uh, Peter Walker, I presume, uh, the uh, federal agent with uh, the crisis response team. Uh, I did some investigating uh, you um, briefly. Uh, when I heard about your visit with a friend of mine. Uh, strangely enough, your website of your organization seems um, barren. Uh, is, there, is there something, uh, is there 
Let me see here. Should I be calling my lawyer at this point in time? My presumed uh, a suspect in some sort of crime. Uh, so as you're talking, uh, Peter Walker just kind of like reaches up and adjusts the rear view mirror and you kind of see him looking with his sunglasses and the rear view mirror back at you and he kind of smirks with this sort of arrogant like smirk and uh, he says, you'll be informed of your rights in due time. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, our department is uh, unidentified special access. Uh, our federal cover as the crisis response team is... Uh, just an umbrella, a facade for what we really do. But we'll have plenty of time for questions when we get where we're going. Um, well, to be, f to be frank, I had an appointment to keep this evening with a friend of mine who's expecting me. Perhaps you could ask me whatever questions you wish to ask now, and I could be on my way. I'm sure you don't have any evidence of my involvement with something. Uh, Peter Walker kind of smiles again and says, oh yeah, no evidence at all, except for multiple people dead through uh, being killed by sword wounds uh, that matches exactly the weapon that we just took off your person. But yeah, other than that, no evidence at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, the guy with the blonde hair and the circular glasses kind of turns back and like gives you the same like very confident, like almost predatory smile. Okay. I don't know if Lucy's going to do any interacting here or not. If Lucy's here before I do anything else. Um, she's just watching the two. Kind of got a bored look on her face. You're bored? <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. bored. Okay. All right, then. Well, um, Kylan, seeing that uh, they're not being um, very revealing or forthcoming about whatever their special access may be. And that since they think that I'm under suspicion of being involved in crimes or whatever, like uh, if bodies being burnt and stuff weren't enough to dispose of them or whatever else, then uh, we will have to, uh, I'm going to have to make a roll here, I think for an action. Uh, uh, what would it, what, what kind of, with, with his strength being at max, uh, I think I'm going to use some blood pool points here uh, to increase his strength to uh, probably a seven. So let me use two blood pool points um, and dexterity to five stamina to five. So I'm going to use six blood pool points here. Okay. So you expend a lot of Vitae to boost all of your natural abilities. Yep. And then, and then uh, I'm, I'm going to... Um, Attempt to, from the back seat, um, break the glass barrier or whatever separating us. And You can um, do that, but you're going to have to first break the bonds on your hands behind your back. That's fine. You said they were like a plastic or something? Yeah, you can attempt to break okay. them. We'll say the okay, difficulty well, will be seven. A difficulty of seven? Okay. All right, let's see. Let's see, I think you get a big dice pool for it. Yeah. My pool is... Is it just strength, or is it like strength and athletics, or like what are we doing here? Like, uh, yeah, I suppose it's just strength. Um, okay. What did you boost your strength through? A seven. Yeah. So. All right. All right. Let's see. Five successes, three of which are tens. Uh, All right. So you easily snap the bonds as though they were paper with your superhuman strength freeing your hands. Okay. And uh, yep. Now I'll just uh, with my hands still behind my back. I'll kind of press them down into the seat for like a leverage and I'll kind of bring my knees to my chest and with all the strength I got, I'm going to like front face double kick uh, or front facing double kick, whatever this glass in front of me um, directly behind the guy in front of me seat. So hopefully disorienting him as well if it breaks here. All right. So go ahead and roll another strength check. You won't need to roll anything to hit since it's uh, just a okay. pane of glass. So, so no difficulty or what? Uh, we're going to call it seven again. Seven and just strength. Okay. Yeah, just strength. Okay. All right, two successes. Two successes. All right. So you pull back both feet and kick as hard as you can and manage to shatter the glass, which explodes sort of inwards into the front seat of the car, causing Peter Walker to swerve abruptly to the left side of the street and pull the car to a stop. 
And very quickly and like without hesitation, the guy on the passenger side seat opens his uh, door and gets out and like draws his crossbow. Okay, so we are we where the vehicle is stopped? Yeah, it's stopped. It's pulled to a stop. Who was I? Who was I behind again? I'm sorry. I thought I was behind the blonde dude. Uh, yeah, that's the guy with the crossbow who just got out of the car. Okay. So do I see my sword uh, within grasp since he got out with a crossbow? Uh, no, he's uh, he's he's carrying it with him. All right. Well, then I guess do we want to roll a combat initiative here? Sure. Okay. Actually, I guess since he doesn't have like a scabbard or anything like that for the sword, he didn't take that from you, and he's holding a crossbow, he really can't be holding your sword. So we'll say it is in the front seat of the car, but you can't easily reach it from the back where you are. Okay. Um, was this like a government vehicle, like a short car, like, a, like an escalator or something? Or? No, it's like a black sedan sort of vehicle. Okay. I don't really know cars that well, but so, it's like a sleek looking luxury so glass, type car. So glass broken, he's out of the vehicle. And where, yeah. where is my, where do I see my sword at? Uh, it's like on the floor of the car in the front seat, sort of leaning against like the where like the stick shift would be in an automatic or whatever a manual. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, should we should we roll initiative still, or what do you want to do? Sure. Okay. Um. An initiative is Dex plus Wits. Yep. All right. So. so. Dice initiative. Plus what's... Um, and you can roll to a string, uh, Lucy if you want. Yep. I got a 16. Okay. Let me roll. Sorry, I'm on my phone. Um. <laughs> can you guys hear my cow? What I'm actually going to rule here is that because um, Peter Walker was occupied with being distracted by what happened as well as pulling to the side and parking the car and the other guy was getting out of the car and, and loading his crossbow or readying it, I'm just going to rule that they've already taken their actions and that you guys can take actions. Cool. Cool. Oh. Well, let's see what Lucy gets and we'll see who starts. Yep. Sorry. Um... I had to pull up my thing. Deck. Oops. So is that is that to say that they've acted first, and then I'll act now, and then they'll be first again, or her? Whatever. Yeah, okay. Flash, you got the initiative by startling them with your action, catching them off guard. Okay. Mine's an eight. An eight. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, so and then plus six. So yeah. Okay, it's eight. Yeah. So then, uh, oh, I rolled it in chat. I'm so sorry. My bad. That's okay. All right. Um, let's switch the rolls. All right, then I'll uh, I'll reach up and grab my sword. All right. Uh, and um, if so if, you kind Pe of... if Peter is still in the front seat, um, I'm I'm just from just from uh, well, just let me know if I do I do. Do I get my sword, or is there going to be? A yeah, so you you okay. lunge through the front through the broken glass window pane, and you manage to like extend far enough with your arm to grab the hilt of the sword and pull it into your grasp. Okay. And, and am I still like? Is my um, the back half of my body still in the back seat? Essentially, like the back half. Of the yeah. Vehicle? Okay. Cool. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So then I'll I'll just retrieve my sword, and um, I'll I'll bring the blade up to the neck. Of uh, of Peter in the driver's seat, um, as if to say, like, like as if to make a like a, a threat, like you know, here, like, don't harm me, and I won't harm him, harm him, kind of thing. All right. Um. So you put the blade of the sword around Peter Walker's neck as he, uh, so that the edge of the sword is up against his throat, and he kind of like freezes and like puts his hands up like he had been reaching for his firearm. But when you did that, he like puts his hands up, but he doesn't appear like 
fr afraid or anything. Like he seems super like cool and calm, but he just puts his hands up and like, meanwhile, the other guy is training his crossbow directly on you, like uh, okay. through the open door. We'll see, we'll see what Lucy wants to do before I say or do anything else. Yeah, I'm headed to my computer. Um, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to astral project. <laughs> which is complicated, which is why I'm walking to my computer so I can do it correctly. But essentially, if I get the roll... I don't think you want to do that in combat, honestly. Shut up. All right, whatever. <laughs> In combat, I'm gonna go to my computer. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a goal in mind for it. I mean, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just wondering. I'm do, okay, I'm gonna. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna change my mind. Technically, they did not disarm me. Um, I still have a Glock on my body as well as a knife. Nice. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna withdraw. Oh, God, but being stuck in the back of a car is really not ideal. Um, I'm going to withdraw my Glock and train it on the guy with the crossbow. Um, so that means they are all in a situation where they have something sort of helping them, correct? The man with the crossbow and the blonde hair smiles that same, like, irritating, like, arrogant smirk and says, well, what a nice little Mexican standoff we have here. And then he kind of spits out the side of his mouth. Peter Walker says, listen, listen, the situation has gotten a little bit out of control. Perhaps we can come up with a different arrangement, but nobody act hastily. Nobody needs to die here tonight. How about we arrange a meeting uh, under my terms, and I'd be happy to speak to you, as I said before, but I don't take kindly to having my weapon taken, being restrained, and being taken somewhere in an unmarked vehicle that I do not know the location of. Uh, Peter nods and says, I understand where you're coming from. Just easy with that sword, okay? H how about you just have your man... Uh, Unload his crossbow and throw it to the side of the street, and uh, we'll be on our way. Uh, actually, so, actually, I presume you're wielding a weapon. Let uh, let let my friend Lucy here come around and relieve you of that as well. Um. Okay. So, in any case, the man with the crossbow has not lowered it; like he's still keeping it pointed at you for the time being. Okay, and I'll just I'll just bear the blade into his neck a little bit and draw some blood, making it apparent that I'm not I'm not I'm not uh, gonna hesitate, um, and I'm being patient. The man kind of scowls, but when he sees like the drop of blood run down the guy's neck, he like cocks his like uncocks his crossbow and points it down at the ground, and he kind of like scowls angrily. I'll just say, ah, see, we we can be gentlemen here. No need for unnecessary violence. And then so, uh, so would Lucy like to? Would Lucy like to? Lucy, would you like to disarm this man up front here? Um, she reaches over, still um, holding the gun towards the guy with the crossbow, but reaches towards the guy, um, sliding her hand down his until she can feel the gun, um, kind of nudging <laughs> the blade that is against him, kind of further into him to encourage him to release the weapon. All right, so you keep your gun trained on the man outside with your right hand, and with your left hand, you reach through uh, the, the broken open window separating the back seat from the front. And with the blade uh, on his neck and the blood dripping down, he you know reluctantly takes his uh, sidearm and uh, you know places it on the seat beside him, or allows you to take it from him, I guess, since that's what you're doing. I'll, uh, I'll say... Uh... Uh, now, uh, what's his last name here? It's Peter what? Walker. White. Walker. Walker. So now, uh, Mr. Walker, uh, as I, um, I'll reach into my front pocket here and I'll grab um, a business card for my private investigation um, services or whatever. I'll slide the card into his front pocket so he's got a contact number for me. And then I'll ask him to exit the vehicle. 
All right. Uh, he steps outside the vehicle, but keeps his hand sort of on the door, and he says, "Listen, this all went sideways. I understand, and I'm going to let you. We're going to all walk off into the night. But I got one thing I got to say. That firearm you just took off me—that's a family heirloom. I got that from my great granddaddy, and I would really appreciate uh, not having to." Uh, explain to my family how I lost that one. So I'd consider it a favor between gentlemen if you leave me my firearm. I'll just say to Lucy, uh, drop the mag and remove the slide and hand it back to him. I mean, he should have thought of that before stopping us so rudely, but I'll be nice. And uh, she does exactly what Callan says. Her knowledge of firearms is decent enough that she's able to remove the mag. Right. So you remove the ammunition uh, from the revolver and, uh, oh, and hand it back to him. Huh? Yeah, that's yeah. okay. Yeah. So she okay. empties out the bullets and hands it back to him. Uh, we'll say. And he says, I really do appreciate that. Um, and he gets out of the car and the other guys, you know, still got his crossbow pointed at the ground. So you told them to get out of the car. They're both out of the car yeah. now. Yeah, well, Lucy, would you mind being a deer and uh, getting us out of here? <laughs> he kind of looks at him and, like, looks at the glass. Um, can you guys just open the doors? I'd rather not have to crawl through this glass. I think you just got out and uh, disarmed him, right? Well, I mean, I would have to crawl through the, the glass to do that because the doors don't have oh. any hands. Yeah. Yeah. So the man with the crossbow okay, well then, well then yanks I'll, I'll, open the, the door from the outside because there's no latches on the inside. Thank you. Uh, Lucy uh, hops out of the car, um, her hand kind of out patiently. Can I have my phone back, please? The man, like, scowls, reaches into his pocket, pulls out your phone, hands it back to you, and says, this isn't the last of this. You must know that. Oh, I, I wouldn't expect any less from you guys. You've got to do your job. I understand that. I'll, I'll say to them, uh, gentlemen, as you've seen here, um, like you'll find in any other investigation that you may be concluding, uh, my action is not without provocation. So if you do happen to find someone that you're suspecting has sword injuries, you may do well to consider that I'm a patient man, and if it came to it, my life was being threatened. But as you have my contact information, we can talk about this later. Man, Lucy. Peter Walker. Yeah, go ahead. Lucy's already unlocking her phone and sending a text um, to one of her many drivers to come pick them up. All right. Just, just to... Uh, Lucy, you could just drive the vehicle that we've uh, asked them to exit. Okay. Um, you could do that, yeah. Yeah, but it is a government vehicle, so the chance that it has some kind of tracking device in it is pretty high. I'd prefer not to be completely uh, observed with... Oh driving their their vehicle um i already have one on the way if that's okay with you so as you guys are talking about this um peter walker and the man that's with him get back into their vehicle assuming that you're not stopping them you're you also got out i'm assuming um and anyways they're gonna drive begin driving away Well, that was fucking annoying. Kind of runs her hands through her hair. A little bit of irritation. In any case, the driver that you called arrives shortly after. Um, do you guys um, want to wrap it up here? or? Sure. I'm fine with, I'm fine with that for now. Yeah. yeah. So, so I missed that. I'm sorry. My wife was talking to me. Um, did you say that they got they got back in the vehicle? Well, and drove it, away, depends, or we, it depends on. Or are we driving away? Situation. Well, it depends on the situation. But what I was simply saying, which is breaking the fourth wall a little bit, is that you know, if you steal their government car, then there's almost certainly going to be like a tracking device in it. 
Yeah, my only goal with taking that was to have a bit of distance between us and them and then ditch, ditching that thing. I don't really care about the vehicle. Cool. But if they're, but if they're gonna get in it if they're gonna get in it and drive away, like that, that's fine too. I don't care. Well, yeah. In any case, um you made them get out of the vehicle. Right. Yeah, I'd prefer it, to drive get some you. distance from them, maybe go a couple blocks and then leave it and they can have it. I don't care. Now they're right. going to go. I called my driver. Okay. So, That's fine. Like, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, so maybe Caitlin. Okay. All right. Um, so do you guys just want to pause here then? Um, sure. Yep. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, okay. That works. Well, um, we got through. What did you say? Cowards? I said that works. No, okay. I said that right. works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cowards. That's always so hard to get rid of Craigbot for some reason. Anyways, thanks for playing, everybody. You can find this on the podcast channel. And hopefully we'll play again soon. I can't get rid of the Craig butt. There we go.